He had just begun to reach maturity when this show was over, and that was a, a, a great loss to, to track and field when we lost Pre. For those of us who were here at the time, that was one of those stories that will, you know, it is the where were you when JFK was killed of, of Eugene. I was the last person to see Steve Prefontaine alive. I probably talked to him maybe two or three minutes before he, he died. And uh, he was fine, I was fine. I said good night to him and we may have even talked about running the next day. And, and uh, I went to sleep actually feeling very good, like, like it had been a great evening. And lo and behold, I uh, got awakened early the next morning by Kenny Moore and he told me that Steve had died heading down the hill. Well, he dropped Frank Shorter off at my house, as near as we can tell, about 10 minutes after midnight on the 30th of May, 1975. A warm, clear, dry night. And he drove off down the hill and about a minute later came around this curve and for some reason took such a hard left that he hit the curb here and that lifted his left front tire corner of the car enough so that when he hit the embankment, flipped the car over on top of him and essentially suffocated him. I was at that last track meet in uh, May of 1975 and I saw his last race and was walking into Allen Hall the next morning for a journalism class and a friend named Mike York, he said, hey, did you hear about Pre? And I said, no, and he said, he's dead. And it was just surreal to think that someone who had become this real icon of, of distance running and courage and, and all that good stuff um, could be gone. My mother called me in college, told me what had happened, and, and I feel emotional right now because that was uh, a shock. And I went out and ran for 20 miles, probably balling the whole way. After the memorial service at Hayward Field, I think they stopped the clock at what, 12.18 or 12.13 or something for a three mile? Somewhere around there, I, I remember. Uh, I was sitting in the East Stands and fairly high up and boy, I'll tell you, I think I was probably the last one to leave the stadium. I, I couldn't, couldn't go. Seldom in athletics do you reach a point as a spectator or as a teammate watching someone come out to the field and you want to just stop everything you're doing and watch. He taught us about passion. Again with Bowerman, I mean Bowerman taught you about passion. Uh, Steve as a pupil probably understood that better than any of us who had competed for Bowerman. But uh, that passion rubbed off on all of us. He taught us how to compete. Competition, being competitive was not always about winning. It was about uh, sometimes losing, taking a fall, and then uh, coming back up and doing your best again. And uh, Prefontaine was, uh, was the best at that. He really not only set a tone for his sport, which is, is really badly lacking today, but uh, as, as you can see doing this interview in Pre Hall on the Nike campus, that for me at least, he set a tone for this whole company. Uh, of all the great athletes that have worn our products on the field of battle, uh, we made a statue of only one of them, and that was Steve Prefontaine. And Steve belonged in running. I mean, he, he belonged in his event. He belonged in Oregon. You know, he belonged in Coos Bay, he belonged in Eugene, he belonged on the Olympic team. That's what he was, and, and I would hope that, that people could uh, learn about him and, and at least as far as he was able to get in his life and say, maybe, maybe that's where I belong too. What were your training? The gun goes, still Prefontaine, and Licori second. America's two great distance runners together, and Prefontaine is giving it everything. He's run the whole race in front, and it looks as if Licori's cracked and Del Bono of Italy is coming through in the third place. It's Prefontaine then, Prefontaine all the way, and Del Bono of Italy second. Prefontaine wins brilliantly, 359.2. Prefontaine sets a new world best time. It's just a fraction outside the meet record. Del Bono of Italy, a new Italian record in second place, and the brightly coloured suit of Licori only manages third.
and 16,000 people here in the Forum really had a, a race for the money in that mile race. Prefontaine running away right from the front, took hold of the whole crowd here, and you're obviously pretty pleased about it. Very pleased. Very pleased. Was it a tactical plan to go out from the front? Well, I think everybody knew my plan. Uh, for me to win a race against competition of, of that nature, I have to go out hard and, and just about lead from the start because uh, the runners in that field, except for Jim Johnson, are all runners that hang on and then outkick you at the last. So I, my tactics was just to go strong and, and run the first three quarters of a mile hard and then just hang on the last quarter. Well, you didn't seem to be hanging on. You looked like you could have gone about three more laps. I could have maybe gone one more lap, but I don't know about three more. <laughs> Does it give you a, a thrill as a long-distance runner to come and beat the milers at their own game? Uh, yeah, you might, you might say that. Uh, I wish I could beat some of the three-milers. Two-mile run. <laughs> and it's lane one on the inside to the left from Villanova, Marty Ligori, who, of course, is the AAU champion in the miles, stepping up today to the two-mile. In lane number two from Spokane, Washington, Jerry Lindgren. Lane three from Yale, Frank Shorter. Lane four is the high school sensation graduate now from East Bay, Oregon, Steve Lefontaine. Two mile run. Say